right of Hebrews says, let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge sexually immoral and adulterous. I would say that this verse summarizes very well, very good summary statement of what Malachi is getting or trying to get across to the people of Judah and ultimately anyone who reads his word, specifically us here this morning. As we read Malachi 2, 10 through 16. For a person not to hold marriage in honor, or some, I think, translated as to not hold the marriage bed in honor, undefiled, is not only dangerous, to marriage in general, to society in general, but it is covenant faithlessness and it is an abomination to God. So as we open up the scriptures this morning, this portion of scriptures, and look at Malachi, what he's proclaiming, my hope is that those who are married will be refreshed and be renewed in their marital covenant uh, workings and their, their vows that they have made to each other, that they'll be renewed to, to show Christ in the church rightly. One of my hopes, but even more so, my, my greater hope even, is for those who are not yet married, or those who are not married at this moment. That they will take seriously these words that we're about to read and study and choose very carefully your spouse. Choose your spouse with utmost care because this is the most important decision you'll ever make. Malachi deals with marriage pretty abruptly, as he pretty much seems to do throughout his Prophecies. He is a prophet after all. He has the spirit of a prophet. And he's just simply going to tell like it is. He's not going to sugarcoat it. He's not going to beat around the bush. He's just simply going to state the truth. And as we read it, we may actually look at it and kind of get offended by it. Or maybe it might scare us, which probably might be a good thing at times. But understand that what we are reading and what we are studying here today is not just Malachi's opinion. This is the word of God. And it is seen throughout the Bible. This is not just one time. It's like, well, maybe this is a, a difference of, you know, uh, uh, maybe, maybe he's just really dealing with one particular aspect, and, and we don't have to necessarily worry about that because there are other things in the Bible says about marriage. Whenever we see marriage, we see a lot of what Malachi is already saying. It is not a disagreement. It is always an agreement. Everything that talks about marriage is in agreement with what Malachi says. He just says it very abruptly. No worry about offending. So as we look at this and we see what it means to dishonor marriage, to defile it, we need to understand that there is a dishonor of covenant marriage. We're also going to see that God will ultimately disregard the covenant sacrifice. And finally, God's design for covenant, or for, uh, yeah, covenant marriage is designed for covenant marriage. We'll be looking at as well. So there's this honor, there's disregarding, and there's ultimately the design for marriage. So if you will, please stand for the honor of the reading of God's Word. If you haven't noticed, I'm trying something a little bit new this morning. Uh, hopefully not to stand behind the pulpit, but I'm a little nervous to... I get off my script, and that... Uh, it can be so often confusing for Micah back there. And so I'm trying to read and, and do my sermon, also trying to change the slides myself, which is a little nerve-wracking for me this morning. So just to let you know, let's read together. Malachi 10, 2, 10 through 16. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem.
Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the heart, I'm sorry, from the tents of Jacob any descendants of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hands. But you say, why does he do? Why does he, uh, why does he not? Because the, the Lord has witnessed against you, I'm sorry, between you, the Lord has witnessed between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion, and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? What has the one God, what, what was the one God seeking? God the offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, Covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Let's pray. Father, again we come. And you have given us a hard word. But I pray that our hearts and our minds would be open, along with the text of your word. I pray that as we study what you would have us to know and believe and to live out, as we study these things, that we would see the wonderful things from your cross. That our eyes would be open to see those wonderful things. Father, I pray also for the cooks as they are looking to go out onto the mission field to tell others your word, to preach the gospel. And I pray that you would give them that ability that they would be able to pay off their, their student loans and their student debts and, and be able to, to garner the support that they are in need of in order to go tell the world and to help take that gospel through the whole world that it may bear fruit and increase among people who do not know you. Father, I also want to pray for First Baptist St. Peter's, our sister church there in St. Peter's. I pray that you would strengthen them. That they would preach the gospel as we seek to do. That they would grow in holiness as we seek to do. That they would grow in their godliness as we seek to do. That they would put off the old self and put on the new as we seek. And they preach your word. I mean, Pastor Joe preached it as a dying man to dying men. Father, we pray that your gospel would bear fruit there and increase those who are there. The knowledge of you, of your will, and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. As we pray the same. Father, we also want to pray for the lost who is not able to be here today because of his back. We ask that you would just touch that back and heal him, that he would not suffer from such pains that would keep him away from the worship. Father, we know his heart. We know he longs to be here. We know he wants to be here and yet cannot be here. So, Father, we ask that you would touch that healing back, that he may be with us again. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please.
So we, if we were going to be honest, there's probably like a ton of ways, a plethora of ways that marriage could be dishonored, that it could be dis, uh, uh, disdained, that it could be defiled within uh, within a, the context of a husband and wife, or, or maybe even now, not even in the context of husband and wife, but in other ways that would be considered to be marriage in this culture. But Malachi here gives us actually two ways, two specific ways that, uh, that marriage is being dishonored, it is being defiled here in our world. And it's not only in the secular world that this is going on, but this is actually going on within the church. It is so almost as prevalent, though it has gone down in recent years, it is almost as prevalent here in the church, not necessarily Highland View, but the church at large, as it is in the world. And there are two ways that this, this is going on, and he, he describes them for us, and so I, I, I kind of separated them a little bit because they're separated in the scriptures. So Matt... Uh, seemed to have permission to jump around in the scriptures last week when he was doing Malachi, so I'm going to kind of do the same thing this week. All right, so uh, so we're going to really start with the beginning of, of this passage, then we're going to go to the end of this passage, then we're going to deal with the middle of this passage. If that makes sense, okay? So because the first way that he describes this uh, this marital defilement, this marital dishonor, is through covenant faithlessness. Covenant faithlessness. But this covenant is not. With the spouse, but with God. We're not talking about he's being faithless to his spouse. We're talking about him being faithless to God. So this is a point where the indictment is, is, is long. We talked about a couple of weeks ago how Malachi generally is going to give an indictment, and then he's going to give a question, and then he's going to kind of give evidence to that. So this indictment's kind of kind of long here, so it's going to take us a while to get through the indictment that he is, is giving, but it starts off with this idea of covenant faithlessness. So he says, have we not, verse 10, have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? So in this uh, quick succession, this is an indictment, though it's, it's a quick succession of, of questions here. The indictment is beginning to slowly take shape. Because there's been a breach of trust in the covenantal promise within the people of God. God is the father of us all. And by that, uh, Malachi is, is, is not indicating here, well, God is creator of us all, and so we all have our mother, all his brothers and sisters of humanity. That's not what he's talking about at all. He is specifically saying that the Jews have been created, that God is the Jewish father, that he is the one who called Abraham out. He is the, uh, the, uh, the father, I guess you could say. Abraham has called him out. He is the friend of Abraham. He is the one who started Abraham and the Jewish nation through Abraham. God is the father of all of us who are Jews. Now, today we would say God is the father of all of us who are believers, all of us who believe in the Christ, the Messiah of the Jews. But God is the father of us all. God created them uh, through, uh, through not just through Adam, but particularly through Abraham, and he is their Father, and that means that every Jewish person must see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm sorry, uh, uh, well, we would see each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, but brothers and sisters, and therefore, what they need to understand is that family comes first. The problem is that they're not having it that way. They're not worried about their covenant between each other. They're not worried about their family. Family is not obviously coming first for them. They're not being true to one another. They're breaking the covenant that was made thousands of years or a thousand years prior to this when they were wandering in the wilderness. It's a covenant that God made with them. It was a covenant that they made with each other. As they're about to enter into the land of Canaan, God says, hey, you can intermarry if you want. Now, you may lose some, some land or something like that, but, but you can intermarry if you want among those who are your brothers and sisters, but you are not to intermarry with people that are of the outside. Specifically speaking of those who are in Canaan, but, but it would seem like the psalmist and, and Nehemiah and Ezra and Malachi all take that to also mean anybody that is not part of the Jewish religion. They, if they want to marry somebody, that person must become a Jew first, and then they can 
marry them, and they would be in covenantal faithfulness with them. But if they marry outside the Jewish religion, they are actually committing covenant faithlessness. So they're not supposed to. It's not okay to intermarry with those outside of Israel, is what Malachi is saying. And notice that he says the word we there. Go back if you want. But look, he, he, he uses that word, the, 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 the very second word there that we have in our e, uh, ESV. Have we. That word we. By using we, Malachi is showing that it is not the unbelievers who have the responsibility not to marry believers, but the believers' responsibility to make sure and not marry a non-believer. So Malachi's issue here is that the people of Israel, the, the men of Israel specifically, are going out and they are being faithless to the covenant that they have with one another and intermarrying with outsiders. That covenant is being violated, it is being dishonored. And that gets us right into the next text, right into the next verse, verse 11. Judah has been faithless, an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of the foreign God. Those are some scathing words that Malachi uses to describe the act being done by the men of Judah, by these Jewish men. Faithless. The NASB, if you want to go there, if you have the NASB, it says treacherous. An abomination. It's profane. And what is it that the heinous act that has been committed, what is it that's so bad that they have married women who are not believers in Yahweh? This was a major issue that, that Malachi comes to tackle. And like I said, not just Malachi here, but, but Ezra does it. If you go through the book of Ezra, if you go through the book of Nehemiah, they deal with this as well. Remember, these are all contemporaries of each other. And so they are taking and tackling this issue of intermarrying with non-believers that it is an abomination. And it needs to stop. And in case we don't understand what an abomination is, let me tell you real quick, let me clear that up real quick, because it kind of gets used here and there, and it may lose its effectiveness at some time. But an abomination is simply this. It is something that God hates. He hates it. So then the God who is love hates when a believer marries an unbeliever. He hates it. It sounds so mean. It sounds so harsh. So unloving to say that God hates it. But he does. And I'll talk to you about why in just a moment. Here Malachi, is called, Malachi calls marriage to a non-believer a faithless act. It's a, it's a treacherous act. And as we saw in the previous verse, this act of faithlessness is against the covenant people of God. And because it's against the covenant people of God, it is an act of faithlessness against God. People of Israel, people of Jerusalem, people of Judah, they were not supposed to see themselves as individuals. They were supposed to see themselves as a covenant people. They weren't individuals separated from one another. They were covenant people linked together by the covenant that was under God. Thus, for some people, some of those men to bypass their sisters and go after those who are unbelievers, right? Their sisters in the Lord go after non-believers for whatever reason or for whatever excuse. They're breaking the covenant. They were acting treacherously and, and faithlessly. They were not thinking of the covenant community. They were thinking selfishly. They were not thinking of their covenant at all. And they certainly were not thinking about the sanctuary of God, which Malachi said they were profaning. 
In other words, they were polluting the sanctuary by marrying a non believer. They defiled it because of their faithlessness. Sadly, as I said earlier, the Christian church is not a whole lot better than the people of Israel here. We are committing as a church, as a whole, many of the same sins, faithless acts, and treacherous acts as the Israelites. Go with me real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Be very easy to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 14, where it says, Do not be unequally yoked with the unbeliever. That would be very easy to go to. If you want to, you can go there and look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with the unbeliever. Because why? Because what is light to do with darkness? What does the light have to do with Christ? Right? We, what, 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 what do we have to do with idols when we are in Christ? We could go there, but we're not going to go there. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 instead. Because I think we get the full weight what it, of, of how sinful it is to be unequally yoked in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look with me, verses 15 through 20. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute comes one, becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not you were bought for Christ. So glorify God in your body. I don't have a whole lot of time to expound on this passage. Lord willing, come January, we're going to be going through 1 Corinthians, and I'll have a lot more time to get into this passage more. But for now, let me just give you some, some thoughts on this passage. First off, these were written soon after Paul ordered the Corinthians to excommunicate someone that was within the church, a man that was in the church who had, was having relations with his stepmother, was making a statement that he was not acting as a believer and thus broke faith with the people of God. Thus, the act was not only against God, but against his covenant community. You see that? That's what's going on in chapter 5. You have broken faith with your covenant community and you have broken faith with God. They're not, not much different. But when we put our faith in Christ, we're joined together with Him. Right? That's what He says. So when we come in faith in Christ, we are part of Christ. Christ is part of us. You're joined together with him, and therefore to, to join together, you were thinking what happened there, but to join together with a prostitute is to bring Christ into that relationship, and the prostitute being anyone who is practicing fornication or adultery, thus creating an abominable situation. You are putting Christ into sexual immorality as a believer. When the, act, when the act has occurred, the person has profaned his own body. The reason being is that he is the temple of God. Bringing Christ in such a, into such a situation as that, he being one with Christ, he is placing Christ in that adulterous or fornicated act, thus profaning himself and profaning the very sanctuary, the very temple of of God. We could be at, aren't you? Well, you know, we're not committing fornication. 
We're not doing that. We're not committing adultery here. We're waiting until we're married. We're not having premarital relations. We're talking about marriage. Malachi is talking about marriage, so we're, we're not doing any of that. But the context, however, goes from the abominable, abominable act by the man that was excommunicated and to believers joining themselves with those who are probably, most likely, temple prostitutes, thus therefore are not believers. And then, going on into what it really ought to be, what, what God has in view for marriage. Instructions about marriage. The very last thing that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, chapter 7, we go there, chapter 7, verse 36, I'm sorry, 39, in these words, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes in the Lord. She can marry anybody that she wants to as long as that person is in the Lord. No, as long as that person is a believer. The prohibition is that no unbeliever is to marry a believer, and the responsibility, therefore, falls upon the believer because they are the ones who are expected to be the obedient ones to Christ and to God. And to the community. So that's the first thing. Covenantal unfaithfulness. I'm halfway through my first point. Whew. But the second thing, is marital faithlessness or unfaithfulness. That dishonors me. This one actually does go against this spouse. So before we saw that marrying the daughters of foreign gods, non-believers, is an abomination to God, it's a profane act against his own sanctuary, his temple. Now we're looking at it saying marital unfaithfulness. Is against, it, against God as well. It's against his spouse, his wife. And it comes in the form of divorce. Look at it in verse 16. For the man who does not love his wife, but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. So the word here that is actually, that we see, right, for the man who does not love his wife, that word is actually, hates his wife. A man who hates his wife. And that word, therefore, for hate is the same word that we see if we go back to first, I'm sorry, uh, to, to Malachi chapter 1, verse 3, the end of, uh, end, of, end of verse 2, and the beginning of verse 3, Jacob I love, Esau I, what's the word? Hey, it, same word there, same idea. Same idea of covenant love versus hate. Covenant love being that which is active, that which goes forward, that which is shown, that which is demonstrated. And the act of hate in that same context is the same thing. Those that are doing acts that are showing that they do not love their wife, that they do not love their spouse. And some would say, well, I don't really hate my wife. Maybe I just don't like her very much. I don't really hate her. Do you understand? That to act in any way that does not show covenant love is to show a hatred. Thank you very much. Oh, that's so nice and cool. Very refreshing. Thank you. Which is probably why, though, because we can all make the excuse, well, I don't hate her. It's probably why the translators translated this, who don't love her. Because that's the idea, though. I'm not showing covenant love. I'm not showing love through my actions. In fact, in my actions, I am showing disgust. I am showing hatred, even though maybe my attitude is not, you know, I don't want to admit that my attitude is one of hatred. I'm showing it by how I am treating her. Covenant love is an action. It's an action word and to demonstrate, to not demonstrate that covenant love, but remove it. 
is hatred. He's talking about a very active divorce. That hatred may come in a bunch of different means. Perhaps this is incompatibility, whatever. But it's hatred nonetheless. Rather than covenant love, seeking the good of the other person, rather than covenant love, looking after the favor and then looking at that person favorably, the men were seeking to do harm. In this culture that Malachi is in, if you were to divorce your wife, you pretty much guarantee that she's going to be destitute for the rest of her life. It's not like our culture, right? Our culture, women, men, they can work, they can make a living, they can you know, support themselves and such. Back then, not so. They weren't able to, to go out and make a living for themselves, for their family, for their children, for their household. Basically, for a man to divorce his wife was basically to abandon her to poverty. Perhaps even cause her death because of the lack of food. It's, it's clearly hatred. Clearly, this is dishonoring to marriage. It dishonors not just the, the wife, but it dishonors as we look at and what we see as, as marriage comes into a fuller picture that we see in the New Testament. Marriage it dishonors the, the very picture that is Christ and his church. Because it is a covenant to love between Christ and all who love and treasure and trust in him. Between Christ and his church. It is a covenant to love that nourishes us and cherishes us, shows us how Christ does those things for us. How he purifies us through the washing of the water of the word. That we may be presented blameless. It's a covenant love that says, by Christ's own mouth, that he will be with us to the very end of the age. Or from the, from the words of, of, of the Hebrew writer, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so therefore to divorce. It's not only to dishonor the, the marriage of, of the spouse, the two spouses, but it's to dishonor the very marriage of Christ and the church. Hence, there's violence upon his garments. He does violence to himself, to his character, to his soul. His wife. You see, it's, it's not simply that the church hates divorce. The church hates divorce because God hates divorce. And God hates divorce because divorce dishonors marriage and blasphemes the picture of covenantal love between Christ and us. Which takes us to God's reaction. His reaction to those who dishonor their marriage. So we went from the beginning, like I said, we went from the beginning and then the end, and now we're going back to the middle. So if you will, look with me, verse 12. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Now, here's the thing about this passage, this, this, this verse. This verse is actually uh, verse 15 that we just dealt with. Those are some of the hardest verses. In fact, many people would say verse 15 is the hardest verse in the Old Testament to translate. Verse 12 ranks right up there as well. These are some hard verses to translate. So, what we could see, and I'm going to give you two points of view here, and I'm going to tell you which one I am in agreement with, but what we could see is if we're looking back... And Matt's uh, 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 sermon and, and the, the passage that he read last week, we're looking and saying, if this person profanes the sanctuary of God, because that's what this, this section is dealing with, this verse is dealing with, if this person who has profaned the very sanctuary of God by marrying a non-believing person, intermarrying with them, 
then they are to be cut off from that covenant community. They're done. Which is what we would see also in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Cut them off from the covenant community. They have to communicate them. Communicate, excommunicate. So it could be that they are to be cut off. At worst, through death. At best, by sending them away. They're on their own. That they have broken covenant faithfulness, and since they broke covenant faithfulness, don't come to the covenant community looking for help. Not until you repent. Right? So it could mean that. It could also mean, as we look at it, I didn't tune my this. There you go. Right? Since he is faith, unfaithful to the community and to God, he has to be cut off from them. But it can also be a prayer. Which is what I really believe that it is. I think it fits better with this context. And Malachi is praying that God would see to it that those who dishonored marriage by marrying non believers would not have children. Cut off the tents of his descendants. Now, some of your verses may not have his descendants would just be him. It's because it's a very difficult translation. It's a very difficult uh, passage to, to translate. The actual reading is awake and answers. That's the actual reading in the Hebrew. Awake and answers. And you're like, well, is the man the one that awakes and answers? Or is it the children that awake and bother him with questions? You know, an anthem, right? You guys know, if you've had children, you know. They wake you up, right? I think that's true. And I think that, and I'll get into exactly the reason why I believe that Malachi is praying that these do not have children in a little bit. He cannot bear to see children being brought into a family where there is one parent of faith and another parent of another faith. And I'll get into the reason why in just a moment. We deal with, with God's design for marriage. But it is God who is the one who would open up the womb if he so chose or close it, right? It's not Malachi. Malachi simply sought that this would be the case. But this was supposed to be a sign, one way or the other, either way that you take it. This is a sign to the people of how bad, how sinful, how awful, how profane, how blasphemous, how abominable it is for a believer, for a, for, for a, a Jewish man to marry a non-Jewish, non-believing woman. It is a blasphemous, profane, abominable thing to do to the point where Malachi either says, excommunicate them, or God, please don't let them have children. Little leaven leavens the whole lump. So Malachi asked God to bring down discipline upon the people who were doing this. So either way, either way you look at it, whichever way you want to translate this verse and understand this verse, it is about discipline. The only question is what kind of discipline? Not if there should be discipline. So for those who are intermarrying, there was a call to perform discipline upon them for their heinous, faithless, abominable for profanity. And for those who are seeking to divorce their wives, we see another type of discipline. So the first one, either cut them off, or Lord, don't let them have children. Second, maybe even perhaps worse than the first. Verse 13. This second thing you do, you come to the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accept it with accepts it with favor from your hand. So the first one is God cut off the tents. Tense of, their, of them or the tense of their descendants. But here, God says that he's cutting them off from communication. The people, priests, 
They come to the altar. God no longer regards their sacrifice. He no longer regards their offering. He no longer accepts them. He no longer delights in the sacrifice. The people realize this, and they come with weeping. They come with tears, not because they are repentant of what they are doing, not because they are divorcing, not because they are intermarrying. They come with weeping and tears because they are not receiving a blessing of God. Remember, they're flooding this with tears, but they're also bringing their offerings. Their, and their offerings are sick, plain, blind sacrifices. They disdain the altar. They disdain their marriage. They disdain their covenant. And half hearted sacrifices from marital faithless, marital faithless men will never be accepted by a holy God. Not just what Malachi tells us. Go with me real quick to First Timothy. I'm sorry, First Peter, chapter three, verse. It says, "Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life." Real quick, real quick. Don't forget. What Malachi said at the very beginning, we, we are brothers and sisters. We are in covenant community, brothers and sisters under the Lord. He is the one who created us. He is the father of us all. Brothers and sisters under the Lord. Peter says the same thing here. She is your sister. They are heirs with you in the grace of life. Sisters, brothers and sisters, right? And if you are going to treat your brother or your sister in such a way that you are dishonoring them, not living with them in understanding, not showing them honor, if, you're, if, you're, if that's how you're going to live, right? Your prayers are going to be hindered, right? He says, don't do this so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, if you're treating your wife like a dog, you need to understand. Get this through, as my mom would say, through your thick skull. That God will refuse to listen to your prayers. He will disregard them. It is not that they will hit the ceiling and fall back down. They won't even get off the ground. A Christian cannot expect God's blessing when he or she purposefully disregards his word. And in this case, the word is about marriage. Let's go back to Malachi. Because God has a design for marriage. We see this all through, through the Bible, and you just follow the game where you see that God shows his design for marriage to us and for us. Look at verse 14. He says here. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, and you have been faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife, my covenant. So the indictment, ultimately the indictment that we see, is that the man, the men, are being faithless. They're being abominable, they're being profane, they profane the sanctuary, right? And God is going to cut off their tents and disregard their, mer or their, their sacrifices. And the question then is, that, that he brings up, why? Why? Why would he disregard the worship? Why would he disregard the sacrifice? Why would he disregard the prayer? And the answer is, God was a witness when the marriage covenant was made. He was there. When you married, you did not just marry in front of your family and your friends and possibly a pastor or, or a, 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 
justice of the peace, right? When you were married, you weren't just married in front of a priest or in front of a, a rabbi or whatever, right, in this context here, right? It wasn't just that. It wasn't just those people that were witnesses of your marriage. God was there. He witnessed it. He was there putting his approval upon it. You married in front of God. He's the witness. And the marital covenant is not simply between two parties, husband and wife. It's between three parties, husband, wife, and God. To divorce the wife of your youth, to show disdain for your spouse, to hate them, and act like it and treat them in such a way is to show hatred and disdain for God. Not only had Judas shown disdain for God through, his, through their sorry sacrifices, but their disdain for God through their sorry treatment of their spouses. Specifically their wives, whom they married when they were young. Flawless complexion. No wrinkles, no gray hairs, no birthing effects, right? Now they're old. They have a couple of crow's feet, they have some grain of the hairs. They may not have the body that they did when they were 18 years old. So let's just go find somebody younger. She was there when you were young. She stood by you through thick and thin, cared for you when you were sick. She helped build the family. And the Lord was witness between you two at the very beginning, and he is still witness between you two at this very moment. But it's more than that. There's a future at stake here. Did he, God, not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So not only was the covenant between the husband and wife, obviously it was between God as well. He is the one who brought them together. Not just in marriage, not just at the wedding, not just before the wedding, but at the wedding night, at the consummation of the marriage, he has brought them together. And the Holy Spirit there, being a portion of that, right? We already saw, First Corinthians chapter 6, that when you are in Christ, you are bringing Christ into that relationship, that you are putting Christ in that very act. And between husband and wife, that is a beautiful thing. But between husband and somebody else, that is a profane thing. It is an abominable thing. And here he says, the Holy Spirit having a portion of that between the two. The Holy Spirit is part of that union between husband and wife. And that is partly to see to it that the believing husband and the believing wife produce godly offspring. There's a future in this is why I say, this is why I believe that that, that verse that we were talking about, whether it's descendants or whether it's it's the the, uh, the, the thing that Matt was talking about, cutting them off completely from the community, this is why I think that this is the, the reason for it, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, way, the take I have on it is because of this verse. Because there is a future at stake. The offspring are at stake. Those who are not married, whether it's because you're not old enough, or yet you have yet to be married, or you're still looking, or because of death, or some other reason, I want you to hear me carefully. Your marriage is more than just about you and your future spouse. It is more than just about you and your future spouse and your parents and his or her parents. It's even more about you than about you 
your future spouse, their parents, your parents, and the com co covenant community. It is about you and the very possibility, probability, that you are going to have children. We need to stop looking so myopically, so nearsightedly. You need to stop looking so myopically, so nearsightedly, about your marriage. You must look five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line, into the future and figure that you will probably have children and you'll be adding them into that equation, and you need to ask yourself how you will reconcile for that child or for those children that you have that one of their parents believes in Christ and says that they believe in the very word of God that Christ is in, and the other parent does not. for them how it is that you have joined yourself unequally yoked. Because how can you plead with your child to receive Christ when your spouse is against him? And if you say, well, my spouse may not be a believer, but they wouldn't necessarily be against that, let me tell you this, you are going against what Christ has said. Because in Luke 11, 23, he says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather, scatters. That's why Malachi and Luke says, God, don't let them have children. We can't let it continue on. We can't let this faithlessness continue on. So before dating, according, before accepting a marriage proposal or Proposing marriage to someone else. Think long and hard about the covenantal community that you have with the church and with God in Christ. Think long and hard about the children that you will probably have that God may grant you. And the conflict that was going to be within that marriage they will see it. They will see the conflict. And there will be a conflict within their own soul. Who do I believe? Mommy or Dad? Who's telling me the truth? Mommy or Dad? Because I only tell you this because the world naturally we begin with a bent toward this world and not toward God. And if that child has the choice between going to church and listening to a sermon uh, that the pastor drones on and on and on with, or staying home and playing video games, or watching television, or going to a soccer match, nine times out of ten, that child is going to choose not going to church. And I guarantee you one of their, their things that they're going to say, well, mommy doesn't come. Or, well, daddy doesn't come. There's a future at stake. So Malachi states, so guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. That wife who is a believer and stuff by you through, through thick and thin, through it all. Don't throw her away. Love her with an ever active love because of the future of your, of your marriage, the future of you is at stake. All right. So this sermon has been really hard for me to 
been difficult to prepare, it's been difficult to preach. It probably goes against almost everything that the world teaches, and probably against a lot of things that, if we were honest, we believe. But it's God's word for us. And so we need to change our wants and our desires and our beliefs to fit the word of God, to conform to it. That being said, I don't want you to leave here without hope. So I want to give you some, hopefully, give you some hope in this very hard, difficult lesson. If you are in a marriage to a non-believer, God does not abandon. As Matt preached last week, we are under a new covenant. And that covenant is based not upon law, but upon Christ and upon grace, and that Christ has died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose again. And so therefore, being that we are under a new covenant, a covenant of grace, we are under that which means every sin Every sin has been forgiven. And where sin increases, grace increases all the more. If you are or have been divorced, you have not committed the unpardonable sin. You haven't. If you're in Christ, all sin is forgiven. He has canceled the record of debt that, that was against us, that stood against us, along with its legal demands. And this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You're, you're no longer condemned because of Christ and what Christ has done. Never been the greatest of encouragers, though. Because just as I want to extend grace, I also want to extend a warning. Because we ought never to take God's grace for granted. Paul wrote that we are not to continue on in sin so that grace may abound all the more. It is only when we have sinned, when we realize that we have sinned, right? It's not like Oh, well, I can just do whatever I want to. Because there's grace. That is not the attitude of a believer. So, if you are thinking about divorce, and Scripture gives only one reason for divorce, and the other reason is <coughs> sinful, turn away from such thoughts. It'll even entertain you. If you are thinking about marrying an unbeliever, turn away from such thoughts. Do not even entertain them. Do not trample on the blood of Christ. So I conclude Malachi the way that he concluded. For those who are married, so guard yourself selves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Guard yourselves. Guard yourselves. Brothers and sisters. Be careful of the decisions that you are making. Whether you are yet to be married or are already married, be careful. Guard yourself. Do not commit covenantal un, uh, faithlessness or marital faithlessness. When you sin against your spouse, confess it immediately. The moment that you realize you have, you have sinned, confess it immediately. And do so earnestly so that God will not disregard your prayers. 
seek to emulate the substance of the shadow, which is Christ in the church. The substance is Christ in the church. Seek to emulate that in your own way.